Okay, well, I was told that a speech should take no longer than it takes you to have sex. So, in conclusion, <laughs> okay, I got. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm the CEO of the company. CEO doesn't mean chief executive officer. It means chief elder off. At 80 years old, uh, it's a fast-paced world. It's a young person's world. It's a great world you'll be going into, but it moves fast. Uh, I've never been able to explain to my friends, I can explain what DNH does, but, but I can never explain the why. But I think you'll understand it because you're getting a much better education than I or my peers got. Uh, to know where we are today at DNH, I think it's go back and go a quick review of history. Uh, the company was started in 1918, but let's go back a little earlier to about 1910. When the D, the D of D and H came to this country, didn't speak the language, he put his brother in the third grade, him in the second grade, the brother was younger, so he said, no school for me. He went out and stole newspapers. When it was raining, he would hop trains and sell umbrellas and uh, raincoats. And uh, it wasn't long before, uh, what, just push it. Move on. How does this work? <laughs> it got three buttons. That's too, too many for me. Oh. That work? Okay, we can go. We can go without it though, for a while. Bluetooth. Anyway, I'll keep going and you work with that. Uh, he saw that uh, there was a need for auto parts. The industry was just starting. There was no supply chain or branded replacement parts. And he bought wrecked pars, cars and took the usable parts off the, uh, the wrecked cars and resold them. And in 1918, he opened the Economy Tire and Rubber Company because parts were becoming branded. There was AC spark plugs and things like that. But tires in those days lasted maybe a thousand miles. So recapping, it's okay. How does it work? Uh, it'll work, you just have to hit the page down button, it looks like, here. So this button right here. If you push this button right here. Okay, Great. good deal, good deal, okay, okay. And he opened the auto parts, but he soon became fascinated with radio, a new technology. You could actually hear the president speak at the same time he was speaking in Washington. That's more mind-boggling at that time than me seeing a man walk on the moon. So he started to sell radios. He got the best line at that time, which was Philco. But manufacturers have a horrible problem. How do they reach their customers in every little nook and cranny? So eventually, they would pick one retailer and make him a distributor to sell to the other smaller retailers in the territory. But manufacturers are very possessive of their product. They invented it, they designed it, they manufactured it, they marketed it, they branded it, and they wanted to keep control of their product. That still exists today. The system that was set up was very much controlled. The distributor was given a territory, so many counties. Uh, sometimes it was limited by how far could your truck go and make a delivery and get back the same day. You were given an exclusive for that product in the territory. And in the re same respect, you gave the, uh, the manufacturer 
that you would not sell any competing products. You were an exclusive distributor for their product in the territory, and no other distributor could come into your territory and sell. It was highly controlled. Uh, the auto parts company, what's wrong? It works now. That button? Okay, fine. That one's that one. No, it's, okay, I'll get it. Okay, the auto parts became DNH Distributing Company. Uh, I said it was a controlled industry. Yes. Uh, distributors had to report their sales every month to an industry association who would then tell the manufacturers what percent of the business you as a distributor got in the marketplace you were responsible for. These penetration numbers you could live or die for. We were house cats, but we had to be a real smart house cat. Uh, if you didn't have a customer in a certain town, you'd had to find somebody that had a storefront or had enough money to rent a store and put them into the business. You were responsible for the business in your marketplace. Uh, DNH grew under this system for 50 years. Uh, in the early 40s, DNH switched from the number one uh, radio line, Philco, to RCA because we had the opportunity to get the Harrisburg, Lancaster, York, and surrounding uh, counties. It more than doubled the size of our market. And that was the way to grow as a distributor. You had to get a bigger market. Okay. But then came World War II. And World War II was not like Vietnam, Korea, or Afghanistan, where only the military went to war. This country went to war. There were no products available. Uh, the DNH existed on wooden toys, paint, anything else we could sell. Okay. In 1944, RCA increased our territory to include Maryland. The RCA distributor sales manager in Maryland was killed when a uh, shotgun fell over in a duck blind. Well, there was no able-bodied people around. Everybody was in the service. And uh, RCA could have given the territory to uh, a Motorola, a Zenith distributor, a GE distributor, uh, but they picked D&H. It was our first major market. Uh, we closed the auto parts in Williamsport and moved the good people into Baltimore. One guy on the parts counter at the auto parts became our warehouse manager. Uh, but we wouldn't have gotten it if we weren't doing the super sales job, because that's basically what that manufacturer wants. He wants volume. He wants number of units sold. But the world was changing at retail uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s chain stores, mass merchants, big boxes, and others were opening up in retail stores in many distributors' markets. Most of the distributors didn't know how to compete with another distributor. Uh, the factories didn't know quite what to do with the system. Uh, most of those distributors were like the house cats that they were. They didn't know how to adapt and change. Uh, Some quit. The RCA distributor in Philadelphia quit. The RCA distributor in Washington quit. And again, because of the job we did, they gave us the territory. Maybe we were an easy sell, I don't know. But it was the one way to grow. We even got Seattle in the state of Washington, which opened our horizons and our mind about how you go to work and how you go to business. Uh, but middle 80s, RCA sold their business to GE. Now, GE was trying to get rid of their TV business, TV business for years, but uh, they did covet RCA's government, defense, uh, and industrial business. So they bought RCA, and within uh, two years, they packaged their TV business with RCA's TV business, and they sold it to the French company Thompson. Well, Thompson came to this country, and you know it's a big country compared to uh, France, and they really didn't know how to handle the situation. So in 1988, they canceled all distributors. 
Where's GE today in TV? They're not there. RCA, they're not there in TV today. Uh, but that was after 50 years with RCA. They canceled us on 30 days notice. There's only one other RCA distributor. There were some real big ones, you know, New York City, San Francisco, LA, uh, the Miami market, uh, in business today. There is only one in business today, and that is uh, one fellow in the Midwest that distributes dog food. So, we had a change. They lived and died by RCA, and they couldn't make it without RCA. Harrisburg being a smaller market, we needed other products to make a living. Uh, we sold stuff that it's almost embarrassing to mention today. CB radios, scanners, 10-foot high satellite, satellite dishes for home use, uh, ground mobile radio and things like that. It was a competitive business. It wasn't a great gross margin, but it helped pay the rent. But we had our feet in that, in that market. We also sold uh, home computers in, Atari, Commodore, and Packard Bell. Uh, so what did we do? We rented our large warehouse. We went into a old ice house. Now, I'm talking to a young crowd here. I mean, this was before there were refrigerated freight cars. The floors in that warehouse, wooden floors, slanted so they could shove blocks of ice onto freight cars. And we operated under those circumstances uh, with so-so products, with so-so manufacturers, that maybe we could make 5% on gross profit when we were used to uh, reputable manufacturers making 15 to 18%. We were lucky that Harrisburg, we came here in 1938, <laughs> was long before UPS or FedEx. But it turned out to be the best shipping point in the country. Uh, it covers more buying power of the country, one day ground delivery, than any other spot in the country. And if you look around here and see all the warehousing and trucking going on, it's all because of that. Okay. We changed our mentality about the county lines and, and just chased volume to become a national distributor. We probably opened and closed 20, 25 warehouses uh, during that period of time until we got it right, until we built the relationship with the suppliers and the customers. It was hard to get better product lines than what we had. Uh, D&H, who? Harrisburg? Wh where's that? And I'm telling you, 99% of the people in this country wouldn't have any idea where Harrisburg is. But, uh, the business was started in 1918. We're still in the distributing business, but it is totally different. But why distribution? You know, I mean, isn't that simple enough? The manufacturer sells to the retailer. Looks simple. But if you look at the numbers, we represent 700, and I can't read it, suppliers. 75,000 products are always in stock and we ship to 21,000 customers. Uh, I can do it here. Yeah. Push this button, yeah, okay. Uh, 5,000 customers at any given time on the books, any month. But you go through distribution and it simplifies a lot of things. Uh, does it simplify it? Not really, we take on all the complications. Uh, it's not simple. But we do the job, and now it gets a little more complicated because with the internet and web sales, we now ship to the, our customer's customer. Remember, we don't sell retail, we sell wholesale. Uh, you can order something from Amazon or buy.com uh, or walmart.com, and it could be shipped out of DNH. You wouldn't know it, because as I said earlier, we're the invisible guy, okay? You know, and, uh, we're not alone. There are many other distributors. These are the big ones. Three of them are international and do 20 to 40 billion dollars a year that we have to compete with. But even with 
the computers, electronics, and mechanical systems, nothing happens without people. Still takes people, smart and committed people. Every operating group in the company is interconnected with every other group. I didn't know how to show it on a graph. I listed a few of the manufacturers up top that uh, you'll recognize, and you know, there's another 650 you wouldn't recognize, and maybe <laughs> another 20 or 50. That, that, the name rings a bell, and I listed the big customers. But in the lower right-hand corner is our meat and potatoes in a lot of respect. All the other VARs, value-added resellers uh, that work with small businesses, uh, but we sell them all. What happened? That's a, there we go. Okay. So I, what I did here was try to show you what DNH does or is inside. Uh, a lot of departments, a lot of interconnecting gears. They all interconnect. Uh, start off with buying, marketing, and trade management. Well, marketing, you probably understand. Buying, you understand. Trade management, 33 people, just to keep the complications of the pricing, the rebates, the subsidies, uh, the support, to keep it all straight. Okay. Then the sales groups on the inside. Uh, home entertainment, the HE is. Uh, sporting goods and housewares. Uh, the, They'll be broken out to two departments next year. Uh, we just got into the sporting goods and housewares a couple of years ago. Then we have the Can Canadian sales group, and we do that inside sales, phone sales, out of Harrisburg. We keep as much as possible in Harrisburg, administratively and directively. Education sales. We sell to all the college bookstores, the colleges, uh, high schools and such. We're the largest TI Texas Instrument Calculator distributor in the country. Then 133 people in uh, consumer product sales on the telephones. Uh, backing them up with 38 people that work on key accounts and outside salesmen that call on the keys, 24. Then we have the logistics. And it's a lot of logistics, bringing the goods in from the uh, Orient uh, or local manufacturers, we prefer to buy in this country, but in some cases we have to buy out of the Orient. Uh, and our delivery system consists of Fresno, Chicago, Atlanta, Harrisburg, and Canada. Canada. The old Camp Hill warehouse, which was our once, our only warehouse, is now just for returns. Now we have Information systems, 90 people in the computer department trying to keep, help us keep track of it, of the business. And business intelligence, that's a group that when somebody needs some information, they can go to the, uh, the files, uh, the hard drives, and draw out the information the operating people need. Up in HR and security, I'm not sure why they're on the same gear, gear here, uh, uh, human resources, we have five people there and a human resource person in every one of the warehouses. And then security, we finally gave up on uh, using ADT or any of the security companies and uh, we're doing it all ourselves, 24-7 banks of hundreds of uh, TV cameras of all the warehouses uh, manned at all times. Uh, to be our own security system. Uh, when things were falling apart, the H of D&H couldn't see how we could exist with 5% margins, iffy manufacturers, and it was really traumatic after all those years that the partnership split up. But at the end, It turned out great. We started an ESOP, Employee Stock Ownership Program. 
I don't know why the whole country and the whole world doesn't go to it. Uh, the employees own 36% of the company. They're committed, they're involved, uh, they have a stake in the game. It makes such a big difference. I said it's a people business, it really is a people business. Uh, at the year end, like most companies, uh, we make a, oh I forgot, credit and finance, I can't forget them, okay? And a uh, highly organized, well-controlled group. Uh, our bad debts are well below the industry standards. So you put it all together, you know, how do you mesh all these together? In Harrisburg, at the headquarters on 7th Street, we have roughly 500 people. We have 25 conference rooms. And there's times of the spur of the moment, I need a conference room, I can't get one, they're all booked. There's so much collaboration and coordination that is needed to make all these manufacturers rules, all the retailers rules, put it all together and uh, be, be successful at it. You know, when you see an ad Sunday in the paper, you know, I mean, the logistics behind it, the getting the goods, when the planning was, uh, it's very much a collaborative effort. We have 70 or 75 employees that are totally paid for. They're on our payroll, but they're totally paid for by the manufacturer. They're specialists in their products, and they're part of the coordination to make it all work. So if the, let me just show you a few pictures here. This is the warehouse today. When we opened those 20 or 25 warehouses. Man, you, you bought an empty space or rented an empty space. You put up some racks. You moved the goods in on Saturday and Sunday, and you did business the next day. But it's not like that today. It looks like a, an amusement park. It looks like a roller coaster at Hershey Park. It starts when an invoice gets to the warehouse. The computer decides what box they all fit into the different products. And that's going to be very important this spring because FedEx and UPS have gone to a different system of charging for freight. It's not on weight. Uh, what do they call it? Dimensional. Dimensional. So we have to be very careful about putting little stuff in a big box. You know, the smaller the box, the better. But it's not like the old days. And our mentally, mentality has to change too. This is a normal aisle. It's 144 inches. A fork truck could get in there and make a turn and take something off the shelving. But we've gone to 80 inch. Uh, you know, my whole career was, how can we do it without more labor, without an extra body? Now in these narrow aisles, you can see that truck at the back there, it's a better picture of it. That's like a $110,000 truck. It, can, it takes the uh, driver up with it. It can turn left or right and uh, pull merchandise off the shelf uh, without turning around. The floor has to have a wire in the middle of it so that truck doesn't, it's so narrow that the, the truck doesn't hit the uh, merchandise or the racks as it goes through. Uh, th this is just a total change. We always worried about labor, but here we're going to have more labor because this truck can't run around the warehouse every place. It's all part of change, of all part growing up. Now here's another one. This is a 40 foot high device. Uh, it's like a Ferris wheel except it's a very tall and very narrow Ferris wheel. 500 square feet it can stock 4,000 different items. Uh, as we grow, space becomes as a premium, okay? But like a good company, at the end of the year, we make a match to the, company, to the employee's 401k, and we make a cash contribution to the retirement program, which is now our ESOP. 
But the ESOP has one big advantage, an amazing advantage. Uh, as a sub S, the corporation doesn't pay internal revenue any income tax. The stockholders are responsible for that income tax based on their percentage of stock they own. Well, uh, how do we do that? On April 14th, we make a distribution to stockholders so they can write a check to IRS on April 15th. And it's a little expensive. It's at the personal rate. It's not at the corporate rate. But the ESOP, when they get their distribution for 36% of the tax liability, they don't have to pay IRS. The money stays in their, in their, in their trust for their retirement. It's an absolute bonanza. No matter what we did on the cash contribution, a good one, a reasonable one, uh, it doesn't compare to uh, the tax rate we have to pay. The company pays close to 50%. We're in so many states when you add it all up. They get 36% of that. I don't, no company in the world does anything like that. And it's, you know, it's because of the government. And the cash in that ESOP, uh, step back, they also get the growth of the company because they own 36% of the company. So if the net worth of the company goes up, their, their retirement plan goes up. Uh, and then we have public stock because of the cash coming in and the growth of the, of the uh, public stock. It's just uh, unbelievable to me. But I hope it stays that way. I don't know why more companies don't do it because less than one-eighth of one percent of the companies in this country are ESOPs. Now, it got some bad press originally I, when uh, owners, to get out of their company, would sell it to an ESOP, uh, overcharge for their company, and, and load the ESOP up with debt. Uh, we did this without any debt to the ESOP at all. Uh, but it's worrisome in one way that uh, President Obama wants to eliminate this because he says that in any company that has more than 10 employees, an employee will never understand why their efforts have anything to do with the success of the company. Yeah. You know, uh, well, he never worked for a company, number one, but, you know, all he has to do is come to d &H and talk to the people. Uh, you hear it left and right. Well, why are we doing that? We're spending our ESOP money the wrong way. Uh, they have a vested interest. They, maybe he should uh, go see uh, William Bendix and O'Gene O'Neill's uh, The Hairy Ape when he says, I make it go. And that's how the people feel. They're part of the team. They're part of the effort. Uh, I have on my desk a little statue, wood carving. It's, it's a clown with a half-deflated helium balloon laying on the ground there. And it says, nothing is forever. And that's for true. It's nothing is forever. It'll all be about change. I can't visualize the change you're going to have in the future. I mean, I didn't know of change uh, from uh, the day I was born uh, until the early 80s. Everything was pretty much the same. Now it's, the changes are, they're happening geometrically. And uh, it's tough for this old guy to keep up with it. You know, they talk in acronyms. And by the time I figure out what EDI or something means, they're five sentences further down the road and I'm really lost, okay? But it's the way, it's the world you're going to go into. Great opportunities. Uh, it's becoming an international world in many respects. You know, I got on the internet the other day and I ordered something from Scotland. I ordered it on Friday. I had it Tuesday. It's going to be a small world. But you know, you're getting the right education, got the right mentality. You can all make it happen, okay? That, you know, and as far as nothing is forever, I'm done with my speech, okay? I'm, <laughs> all right, questions? Oh, I wasn't that good. <laughs> Nothing?
was the most challenging aspect of your career? Putting up with my kids. <laughs> oh, my kids there. Uh, uh, old mentality versus new mentality. Uh, the, the, the partners that didn't want to change, we've been doing it for 40 years, why can't we just keep doing it? It doesn't work that way anymore. You know, you know what happened to Schwinn Bicycle? You know, what, what happened to Kodak? What, what, you know, these were names that owned their industries. Uh, Polaroid, you know, sometimes the names around somebody else bought the name and, and try to ride on the coattails of that uh, name. But things will change and change fast. The retailers, nothing in retail is forever. Right now the big gun is Walmart. Uh, but who knows what it will be 10 years from now. You know, the, getting bigger doesn't make you better. You've got to work very hard to be concise in a, a tight little company. Now we're a family company, but family and mentality. We've had five presidents. Two of them weren't, weren't relatives at all. You have to let the cream rise to the top. Uh, we treat our people like family, but we run it like a business too. Yes, sir. Wait, the hearing aids work, but not great. Hearing aids, by the way, are like crutches. You can't run with crutches, okay? <laughs> you were talking about old mentality versus... What's that? You were talking about the older mentality versus yeah. the modern. What are some of the good attributes of the old mentality? Well, it's very, com it's very comfortable. Uh, uh, like, it's a, like it's an old jacket. You feel comfortable when you put it on. You want me to wear that? You know, it, it just change scares people. It is scary. There's no doubt about it changes. You got to stick your neck out a little bit, uh, but you don't want to bet the barn. But we did stick our neck out, and, but we didn't quite bet the barn. We came close at times, but it was a case of trying to exist, and we existed, okay? I don't know if you heard, what were some of the benefits of the older mentality? What are some of the strong attributes? I think the conservative nature would be one, right? That you, you basically keep the equity in the company. Yeah. Uh, don't take a risk. You know, you buy from RCA four times a year. They tell you what to buy. Uh, you remember, you were a controlled house cat. And then you'd argue with them that we don't sell Danish modern in, in Pennsylvania when television sets were wood furniture. You know, we sell early American. And you, you could move a little bit, but not a lot. They told you what to do. Yeah. You mentioned before that um, a lot of the companies in the 60s, 70s, 80s did not keep up with the changing times and that they closed down. In your opinion, do you think it's possible that if a company does fall behind, that they can come back? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, if you got the right people, you, you, you got that drive, you, can, you know, it's a, it's a horse race. It's not over until the, the finish line, and you know, you got some guys that are good closers. May I ask a follow-up? What? May I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Okay. What do you think would be the first step in trying to come back if you fall behind? Well, you got to pay the rent, <laughs> okay? And so that means you got to do business. You got to sell something, you know, and uh, that's what we did. Yes, sir. Um, in, in your business, it sounds very complicated, and, and uh, oh. employees have to. Complicated frequently, is right? is an so, understatement. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you think is the best way that you communicate changes or things to your employees? Do you prefer holding meetings or emails, or what do you think is the best way to communicate with your employees to reduce misunderstandings? Well, we're using ADP now. I'm not even sure what ADP. There is another acronym. It's it's a uh, payroll system. It's a uh, it's a site where they can see see their paycheck every week, and we use a lot of that for a lot of announcements. But we do use email. Use email a lot. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. You know, you got to think. Did I tell everybody I should tell? You know, because uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the terminology. But if you if you do something and don't tell everybody, somebody may look at it and say. 
you know, that's wrong. Or why, why are they doing that or why didn't they tell me? We run a very, very open book. You know, uh, I've never worked for another company, but I can't believe they put as much information out for all the employees as we do. We need smart employees. Uh, Maybe mention the town halls, how you get feedback. Yeah. Uh, something that these guys started. Uh, at one time, I knew every employee. I knew whose wife was sick. You know, I knew whose kids were having trouble in school. To, today, I don't even know the names. There's too many people for me. Or it's, it's the old brain. You know, I'm like a hard drive. I got so much information in there, it's working so slow, I can't get it out. Okay, but uh, they started town hall meetings where the employees get together, they have questions, they want explanations, uh, just an open discussion group. You run them, Dan, what do you have to say about them? Well, in, in large companies, you can't make decisions yourself. Most of the best ideas come from throughout the organization, so we find the best leaders solicit ideas from entire, from throughout the organization and empower them to make change and drive the business forward versus just following direction. That doesn't work very long as you get bigger. You need uh, to, to decentralize the power, get people to decision making, and ask people to uh, push the business forward. Okay. To explain the business a little more, when we were running our tail off to stay in business in the 90s, and uh, we bought computer system after computer system and programs after programs. They didn't work well together. They, I mean, there were times where the sales desks showed this was the inventory and the warehouse says, no, our system says this is how much we have in stock. Uh, and a few years ago, we decided we have to grow up. Uh, ERP, Enterprise, ERP, e Report, huh? Enterprise resource programming. Enterprise resource programming. We went to the leader uh, of that. Uh, Oracle? No, before Oracle. SAP. SAP. Well, after two weeks, we realized they were so fixed and rigid, it wouldn't work for us. So we went with Oracle. And after two years, and people from India in the place, and $20 million spent, it didn't work for us. Neither of those systems were structured that Walmart wants to run something on <laughs> Saturday and they'll tell you about it on Thursday and they want you to change something. And that's what we have to do. You know, the customer's the boss. And we decided two years ago to go with Microsoft AX because it's a lot more flexible. Now we've worked two years and we're going to install a little bit of it this spring. It's a tough job. And one of the problems is there's not a lot of experts in this country on ERP. Uh, Europe is about 10 years ahead of the United States on that. Denmark has more ERP specialists than all of the United States has put together. There is one comment I'd like to add. Maybe I'll just turn around so you can. This is why he, Dan, uh, Izzy picks on us because we can't help but talking when he's talking. But uh, the one question someone asked about how you reinvent yourself, uh, one example that we can speak to personally is Samsung. So all of you are familiar with Samsung. You might have their phone. You might have their tablet. They're one of our largest manufacturers that we distribute today. When we first picked up Samsung, they were what you would consider a third tier manufacturer, believe it or not. They made black and white, small 13-inch color TVs that you might put in your garage, literally, at best. You would never have it in your living room. And today, people are proud of what Samsung has become, you know, as far as what they offer, as far as televisions and technology products. Well, what changed? Well, they reinvented themselves. And we call it sort of staying ahead of the curve, um, catching the wave, riding the wave. So they saw the move from what was a regular CRT, a big television, to flat screen televisions. And they became the leader in that technology innovation and became the de facto standard that allowed them to become what they are today. LG would be a, a similar example. In our business, you can think about what's transpired of the products that Izzy sold that, uh, told you that we sold over time. So what are we looking at today? So I don't know if you're familiar with GoPro as a little digital camera that people use for outdoor enthusiasts. Well, DNH is the distributor of that product. So we sort of caught that wave 
and we're helping reinvent for our customers that opportunity to get into a category of business that maybe they weren't in before. And it's always about looking ahead. We call it looking around the corner, looking around the curve, and seeing what is it that maybe you can capitalize on in the future. It doesn't exist today, it's not mainstream today, but you're basically investing in areas of technology or whatever, it could be in healthcare, it could be any vertical industry that you're working in, and figuring out what it is that is going to be meaningful in the future for your customers, not necessarily what has been meaningful in the past. So when Izzy talks about reinvention, I think that's a critical component in our business in many industries on how you stay relevant to your manufacturers and your customers is by looking around the curve. You know, uh, another example of change. Everybody's familiar with Dell. Dell, smart guy, he built his business on direct to the consumer. Today, 40% of his business goes through our channel. You can only go so far one way. Distribution, uh, complicated, iffy, but we make it work. The other uh, question that came up, I'll make an additional comment on, is how do you communicate to your employees? So, you know, Izzy mentioned uh, email, you know, face-to-face -face conversations. There's nothing that replaces that interaction. Dan mentioned what we do at town halls and we solicit feedback from every level of the organization to make sure that we're, their voice is being heard because the best ideas come from the people around us, not necessarily from the senior management, as Dan mentioned. But then there's electronic communications at a whole different level. You know, there is beyond email, you've got Twitter and Instagram and instant messaging and all different ways you can communicate. In a B2B environment, it really does come down to the, I would separate it from Facebook to LinkedIn, right? Just think about it from that mentality. When you think about Facebook, you're thinking about friends and family and different type of interaction. When you think about uh, LinkedIn, you're thinking about a B2B. A relationship and that's sort of how we think about our communication it's got to be at a professional level it's got to be no shorthand it's not like you know you know you're putting the letter U for replacing the word you in a business to business environment you have to think about how professional you need to be in your interaction so that's why we would stay away from um, you know things that maybe are more personal in nature but at the same time we want to communicate to our customers in a way that's relevant to them so Twitter happens to be one of those uh, um, tweener type technologies where it is a consumer oriented you probably follow a lot of people that tweet on a personal level but in the business world it's becoming much more relevant as well so we have a Twitter feed you can follow D&H but basically we're announcing new products we're saying we're you know opening up a new warehouse we brought on uh, this new manufacturer we're having a sale on this product we're having a reseller show we're inviting our customers in on this date and we're using that as an additional communication mechanism to make sure that our customers uh, have access to the information we want them to have in the way they want to see it. So it's not a defined in a moment in time. I would equate that to change over time as well. As new ways to interact with our customers evolve, we're going to make sure that we offer that as well. How do you build innovation into your culture? You said you, know, you always want to be looking ahead. You want to have the next big thing. Well, we you just also said you're yeah. kind of conservative. You don't want to. Well, we we just get in all we got into all the Fitbit, the uh, electronic yeah, watches. Yeah. I tried one for a day. It says chubby. I didn't want any part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the the key to not getting stuck in your ways, the sort of sort of living, we've always done it this way mentality, is to, and it really starts from the management level down, but to. Um, allow the decision-making process to disseminate throughout the organization. And basically, if you think about, you know, from Izzy's generation, born in 35, my generation, born in 63, Dan in 68, you guys are millennials. There's a whole other generation coming up. And we pay just as much attention as to what they have to say as to what I experienced in my lifetime and what Izzy has as well. So it's really an equilibrium approach to make sure that the people that were just hiring this week and last week and the year before, that their ideas and their go-to-market strategies and their ways that they see us evolving as a company are as meaningful to as what we would want it to be. So for example, when we first started, you know, we had our computer terminals and you, know, you weren't allowed on the internet and you basically sort of had to sort of function within 
uh, the space that it has defined. Today we have people working remotely from home. We have people you know, working on the road. They have access on their smartphone to everything that they would have on the computer terminal. And the real world is now 24 by 7. You know, there's no sort of off, you know, turn, you know, turn down the dial and you're not available. It's basically saying we're all in and uh, I know you guys experience this, whether it's a school or your personal work, uh, life or professional life, you're always available, right? You're always checking your phone. And that's basically the way you've got to think about your job and your responsibility as you get into the working world. I think that expectation is going to be rather high that you're all in and committed to the organization. The other thing we try and do is have people understand that DNH is all about a career, not just a job. And I encourage all of you to think about that as you go out into the working world and sort of establish yourselves and decide physically where you want to live, who you want to work for, do you like what you do. We're fortunate that every day we wake up, we really do enjoy what we do. And it's uh, a dramatic difference if you like your job or don't like your job. And we encourage people to come to DNH thinking about that as, hey, we want you to spend the eight plus hours that you are at our offices in an enjoyable atmosphere. We say that because over time you'll realize you spend more waking hours at your job than probably you will with your family. So you got to enjoy what you do. And then at the same time, when you think about that culture, it's basically making sure that uh, from a career standpoint that we give people growth opportunities. That you got to think about, all right, I'm working for a company, I see it as a job today, but do they have expansion capabilities? Are they growing? Is this a place that's looking globally? Uh, is this a place where I like my coworkers, I like their ideas, it's people that I want to not only spend a day with, but I want to spend years with. So there's going to be opportunities where you have to maybe move jobs, switch careers. I encourage you to think about it in a long-term perspective, because I think that's extremely relevant to making sure that uh, you're working for a company that embraces change, that values the input that you have, and that basically in so many ways fulfills what you're looking for as a career. They're going to look to you, speaking from a management perspective, to be all in and capable and wanting to take on more responsibilities. You know, I like my company because with those 700 suppliers, always trying to be nice to our employees, we have more happy hours than I ever had in college. <laughs> you know, and think about the future. We're selling these Fitbits and all these electronic things. Well, maybe we, maybe we should be in the wristwatch business, too. You know, we are a distributor. We're not a housewares, a computer, a ho a sporting goods, a home entertainment. We're a distributing company. And we have to keep that in mind, too, that all, if a product needs distribution, we're here. A good okay. example might be 3D printers. You might have some on campus already. But basically, over time, we sold, you know, at your home, in your college dorm, uh, if you worked over the summers, you know, you've got HP laser printers and you've got Epson Inkjet printers. Well, now with the 3D printing technology, you know, DNH has uh, sort of looked ahead of the curve, caught that wave, and we have three or four different 3D printers that actually print physical devices, not just pieces of paper. And uh, that's robust in a growing industry, uh, growing exponentially, in fact. So, you know, to Izzy's point, it is sort of making sure that we're positioned ourselves for the growth for the future. Comments, questions? Well, let me just tell you one thing about 3D printers. I'm at the hearing aid guy in New York, and he says, I really would like to fit you with custom ear molds. He says, but it's such a hassle and half of them come back wrong and you got to do it over and over again. I said, well, why don't you get a 3D printer? I mean, you could stick wax in there, get a mold, set it down, do a 3D scanner, and you could, you could make it right on spot. At least I never thought of that. You know, so there's, there's many, many places where this 3D printing is going to come in with the dental work, uh, replacement parts. It's, uh, 3D printing is going to, going to change the world an awful lot. And you see things that I don't understand. Uh, if anybody knows what a, a, an adjustable wrench is, where you've got a, a handle and a jaw, and you've got another jaw that works on a screw up or down, they make it at one time, not three pieces and put it together. I don't know how they do the screw around and all that, but they do it. The technology will get bigger and better and faster and more intriguing. And I love it. Okay? 
What are the pros and cons of being a family working together? I'm lucky. I really am lucky. You know, I've got two kids that know the business better than I do. Uh, I got a daughter, she's the black sheep. She went to work for IBM after college, and then AT&T hired her to call on uh, uh, IBM, and uh, has a great life. And now she's working for us part-time also. I'm, I'm lucky that way. You, got, you, know, you, got, you know, uh, this partner that left, the H, uh, he does great charity work in Harrisburg. Uh, we're there with all the charity work too, but like the invisible, we're there as the anonymous. When you see the gift is from Anonymous, it could be from us. Uh, we, we're not in the newspaper, we're not in the yellow pages or anything like that. But uh, he had a son that was bad from five years old, and he never did much about it. I, I think the, uh, the one thing about family businesses we found is that you still have to run it like a business. So growing up in a, especially multi-generational, it's not your last name. So we, I've got friends that have family businesses and the kid graduated college and the father promoted him to vice president of the company, first day out of college. What does that person know about running a business or what the other employees have been through? And oftentimes there's a lot of resentment and that person's not successful. So for us, we have what's called a family constitution where it says if, when you graduate college, you have to work for four years. You have to have practical experience before you can add any Somewhere value. else. So yeah. a different company. And then when you come to the company, you start at the bottom, the same compensation as anyone else, and you have to deserve your promotions. So I think that's a large part of why people feel with any company that uh, it's, it's, it's got to be based on performance. And I would encourage you as you're moving into the working world or as you graduate to think about working for a family business. And I say that because my observation has been that they care a little more about their employees. Not to diminish the value that public companies have in the world. They employ the vast majority of people across the country. But the reality is they answer to their shareholders. As a public company, they have a responsibility that's a little different than a privately held company. On a quarterly basis, they need to report to the analyst, and they care a lot about their stock price. So I think from an individual satisfaction and in working for a company, my observation's been talking with people in other industries that have family businesses. If you can find the opportunity for a career in a family business, I think you'll reap a lot of satisfaction being in that environment. There's a lot of positives that are maybe intangible. It's hard to sort of define, but you'll get a sense that they care a little more about their employees. I just read eBay's laying out off 3,000 people. Uh, the oil companies are laying off 7,000. Halliburton's laying off 7,000 people. Now, they do that instantly because the stock, oil prices are down, whatever's going on at these companies, they literally, banks have laid off tens of thousands of people. They do so because it's just on a spreadsheet and this is, you know, we need to cut this much overhead. A family business doesn't think like that. It's more of a person to person relationship. There's a lot of, we know people's families, we know they depend on us for their livelihood. We don't make those type of decisions. I think we're representative of the fact that, you know, we treat people as people, not just as, as an employee number. Now, I didn't start at the bottom, though. You know, when we moved to Baltimore, our warehouse was on the wharf. And I used to go in on Saturday morning. They had me climb up on the top of the boxes and wipe the, the wharf rat poop off the cartons. <laughs> so I didn't start at the very bottom. <laughs> and if you ever came nose to nose with a wharf rat, I mean, the, 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 well, I'll tell you, one used to walk right by uh, the office every day at 4 o'clock. One of the girls bought a, a loaf of bread and cut the heels off and make a sandwich. She liked the crust. Threw the, the loaf in the waste can. Later in the day, the rat's walking with that whole <laughs> loaf of bread in its mouth. Scary. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you guys very much. Yeah, okay.